We keep uh, focusing our attention on what happened on the surface of this planet, the Earth, which is just a, a, a relic, a, a rock that was left over from the construction of the sun. We keep obsessing with this uh, real estate that we find on this rock and we are willing to kill each other for territories. There are currently two wars going on related to territorial disputes. And if you think about it, it's very narrow-minded because there is much more real estate in outer space. But I do think that if that we can go through shock therapy, meaning if we discover that the, another civilization near another star is behaving in a, has accomplished much more than we did, you know, it's sort of like meeting a student in the class that is doing far better. And uh, you realize <laughs> that by imitating that student, you can do better. Uh, I think scientific knowledge is always good for us because then once we realize what reality is and we are not illusioned, then we act in a more responsible way. Today we have the incredible Professor Avi Loeb joining with us on The Seekers Mind Talks. He is an astrophysicist and has served as the longest serving chair for the Department of Astronomy at Harvard. He has authored over eight incredible books and 800 scientific papers. But what makes him special is his ability to deduce seemingly complex subjects into distilled simpler versions. Talking to him is like a child looking at into the deep, vast sky at night. He is able to make you think and explore the vastness and the possibilities of human intelligence. My conversation with him on a personal level was a delight for me and there are gems and lots of insights stored for you in today's episode. Don't miss it. As usual, I'm your host Raj and enjoy the conversation with Avi on The Seekers Mind Talks, the science and spiritual podcast. If, if by chance an alien civilization just stepped up into our sky tomorrow, what would they think of us? Oh, um, it's very likely that they are far more advanced because they reached our doorstep before we reached their doorstep. And so um, it's just the way we would look at past uh, generations, you know, going, going back thousands of years or, um, you know, even more than that, the tens of thousands. Uh, you wouldn't be very proud of what, what you see. Uh, back when we were hunters and gatherers, you know, we were indistinguishable from nature. Now uh, we have one century of science and technology, so we feel a, a, a hubris as if we are in control. But it's not really the case because the, you know, we know a little bit about the physical reality, but I think we are missing the big picture. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, in the context of the universe, uh, we know 15% um, of the matter content. It's matter that we are made of. But it looks like most of the matter in the universe, 85% of it, is a substance that we've never witnessed. We call it dark matter, and we quantify how much we're missing. But we don't know what it is. And that's, you know, 85% of ignorance. Uh, we talk about the universe starting from a point in time, the Big Bang. We don't know what happened before then. You know, that could not have been the beginning of all time, right? It, there should have been something before that that triggered a baby universe that we currently inhabit. And maybe if we understand that, we will be able to create a baby universe in the laboratory. You know, that, that's something that our visitors might know more about. They may have a quantum theory of gravity, which we don't possess at the moment. So all I'm saying is, you know, the, currently our knowledge is growing. Uh, in some areas it's growing uh, uh, gradually in others is growing exponentially, like, for example, artificial intelligence. Um, and um, if you extrapolate a uh, 100 years into the future, a 1,000 years into the future, you know, our, our, it, what we are going through right now would look really primitive to the, mm -hmm. those future generations. So, so I, my expectation is that our visitors would repre represent our technological future and therefore they would not be very impressed. And, and, you know, it's really quite uh, presumptuous of us to send a golden record with uh, the Voyager mission that includes uh, music uh, and, uh, uh, you know, a picture of a, a man and a woman 
uh, and all kinds of things that we feel proud of, at least previous generations of humans felt proud of. I, I, I don't like the music from the 60s very much. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's really presumptuous because um, we think that they would uh, actually appreciate us letting them know how primitive we are. Mm. And that's because we are self-centered. You know, when uh, if you go on a date uh, and you meet a partner and, and all you can think of is about yourself, uh, that, that does not reflect very well. Uh, and, and, and that's where, where we are at the moment. We can't really expect our future, uh, but they may have gone already through what we are going through. And, you know, we would look like um, ants to them and something rather primitive that uh, should not be uh, treated very seriously. I mean, they, if they arrive here, and, and it really depends on the propulsion method, but uh, with chemical propulsion, the type that we used for Voyager, for example, it takes a billion years to cross the Milky Way galaxy from one side to the other, uh, the Milky Way disk of stars. I just did, a, I submitted a paper for publication uh, with my undergraduate student uh, just about that. Where will Voyager be in a billion years? We calculated that and it will be opposite uh, to the sun uh, on the other side of the Milky Way disk. Um, a billion years is just 10% of the cosmic uh, history. So it's not a, you know, it, there could have been such uh, voyages uh, in the past uh, from other civilizations that predated us. Uh, but the point is that they could not have anticipated that we exist when, you know, if the journey takes a billion years, uh, Earth was rather primitive. And so if they arrive here, it's probably not because of us. Uh, and uh, it's very presumptuous of us to think, oh, no, well, at first we thought we are at the center of the universe. And then uh, we keep thinking maybe we are alone. And uh, moreover, if someone visits us, it's just because we are amazing, you know, and all of these are mistakes that uh, a single people make before they find a partner. Yeah, I, I found an interesting line from your book regarding this. You said that humans, we think uh, it's like hum what our knowledge now is like a child sitting inside a home and thinking that there's nothing in interesting outside the house to play with. And that, that, that's a really good statement. I love that. Well, another thing is that, um, you know, Enrico Fermi asked uh, 75 years ago, he said, um, where is everybody? And uh, he didn't make any attempt uh, to look for, uh, to seek others in the universe. He was just sitting at lunch at uh, Los Alamos and, and wondering where is everybody. And, you know, if a single person asks this at home, you tell that person, well, you need to be uh, proactive. You need to leave your home, go to dating sites. At the very least, you need to look through your windows. And that is what I'm trying to promote right now using telescopes and uh, uh, expeditions to figure out what lies outside the solar system. And it's really inappropriate uh, to keep asking where is everybody without seeking uh, partners because space is vast and time is measured in billions of years uh, in the context of the universe. So you can't, you know, new knowledge does not fall into your lap uh, without using instruments. Mm. And uh, here I'm referring also to Elon Musk, who said, I haven't witnessed any aliens. Well, you really need to work hard to gain new scientific knowledge. You know, we invested a billion dollars in, in the Large Hadron Collider to find the Higgs boson. Uh, we wanted to find the dark matter. We haven't found that. Uh, we invested the $10 billion in the Webb telescope uh, to, to discover the first generation of galaxies. And um, so the point is, it really takes a long effort, uh, uh, you know, many decades and a lot of money to, to make progress in our knowledge. And you can't just say, where is everybody? I haven't seen anything unusual because, because that this way you would never um, improve your knowledge. And you know, I do think that science is driven by a childlike curiosity. You should not pretend anything and just, you know, uh, be curious about the world. And the moment you lose your curiosity because you think you know the answer without putting the effort, um, at that moment uh, will keep you ignorant. Mm -hmm. uh, so you might get accolades, you might get uh, awards, honors, you might feel good about yourself, but... Um, to me, all of this is really secondary to learning something new. 
And in this case, learning whether we are alone is really the biggest question that we can address. So but, yeah, but are we ready for them? Because I was listening to this podcast from ISRO chairman Somanath last week, and he was saying that he is scared of finding aliens because they might trash the ants out of the backyard, right? Are we really ready to face them? We can't even to uh, seem to have an opinion to cooperate among ourselves. We are still fighting among ourselves. Yeah, but, but think about the, the church during the time of Nikolaus Copernicus. Actually, I was invited to Torun, Poland, uh, earlier this year in celebration of 550 years to the birth of Nicolaus Copernicus. And he, he basically realized that if you put the sun in the middle of the solar system, you get a much better prediction of Easter, something that the church cared about. And he was a priest trying to help them. So he told them, you should use my model, not assume that the earth is at the center. And of course, they were very happy to use his model, but they told him that's just a theoretical model. We all know that in reality, the earth is at the center. And they banned his book until the 19th century. It was a forbidden book. You can actually see the book behind me uh, opened uh, on my left uh, shoulder over yeah. there. Uh, and because that, that's the gift I was given by um, the um, uh, regional uh, uh, administrator of, of, of that uh, town. Um, and so um, at any event, I gave a talk about the next Copernican revolution. Um, now you can ask, okay, uh, was the church, the approach of the church justified? I mean, they would argue, you know, uh, people are not ready to realize that uh, they are not at the center of the universe. They would argue it's actually bad politically for the church to give people the impression that they are not being monitored by God. If Obviously, if they're not at the center, then why would we be the most interesting things for God to take care of? Maybe the bureaucracy up there is so uh, complicated that they wouldn't care about us because there are so many exoplanets. I don't care what the argument is. The point is this delay tactics of facts about our cosmic neighborhood uh, is not good for us. Why? Because if we ever want to get to Mars or to get you know, to uh, other locations, we better know where we are. We better know that the Earth moves around the sun. Uh, if we, otherwise, if we send uh, launch a, a rocket to reach Mars, it will go in the wrong direction. You know, it will just not reach Mars if we don't have a good model of the solar system. So um, it's really b better to know where we are uh, it's always better, and, and we shouldn't really put into consideration our limited understanding uh, to start with. Uh, I think scientific knowledge is always good for us, because then once we realize what reality is, and we are not illusioned, then we act in a more responsible way. Just imagine that there are neighbors, there are visitors, we just don't pay attention to them, and they are all around us. Okay, and then we argue it's better not to know if, if there is anyone around us because then it would make us more worried. But if they are around us, they are around us. Okay, and it's much better for us to know it so that we can cope with that reality. So in my view, you know, we have to really be open to new knowledge, scientific knowledge, no matter what. You know, uh, I, I'll give you another example. During COVID-19, there was this conjecture that it was a lab leak. Okay, mm. that's a scientific conjecture. Why is it scientific? Because it's, a, you know, either it, it came from a lab or not. You know, this is something that happened and you just want to figure out why it happened. Okay, but it was mixed with a political narrative and people were uh, told not to discuss it. Uh, just today, uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, 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 wrote a letter saying that he, uh, as the head of Meta, uh, you know, the, that hmm. was formerly Facebook, uh, was actually told by the U.S. government to censor content on Meta that, uh, you know, is not to the liking of the U.S. government rela related to mm -hmm. COVID-19. So now you, you may ask, OK, well, should we mix uh, politics with science? And my answer is no, because if... COVID-19 came from a lab leak, 
then you want to prevent it in the future, just the way you want to prevent a Chernobyl in the future that would affect public health. And how to prevent it depends on what was the cause of it. So we should get to the bottom of it, irrespective of politics, so that it will not happen again. It makes little sense to say, I don't want to know. So stop mm. talking about it. Why? Because then it will happen again. Suppose there are experiments, you know, game of function, and, 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 and suppose governments are funding them, and suppose they are careless, and suppose a leak is possible, then uh, we would keep being illusioned that had, it had nothing to do with it. And, and, and if it happened as a result of a leak, then we are endangering public health in the future. So we really need to know the public needs to know in order to act accordingly, and the same applies to extraterrestrials. There is something really about the human ego, right? You, you, you talk about this, about the scientific enterprise as well, as a barrier to knowledge, right? Because the ego stops the human mind from expanding after a certain level, and if you are looking at an intelligent species, it will be at the least intelligent enough to look past its ego. Right. So, um, yeah, in fact, um, <clears throat> uh, we keep uh, focusing our attention on what happened on the surface of this planet, the Earth, which is just a, a, a relic, a, a rock that was left over from the construction of the sun. Okay, so there was some material left over in a disk and out of that came the Earth. Uh, and then... Um, we keep obsessing with this uh, real estate that we find on this rock, and we are willing to kill each other for territories. There are currently two wars going on related to territorial disputes. And if you think about it, it's very narrow-minded because there is much more real estate in outer space. And uh, what is a sign of intelligence? A sign of intelligence is recognizing you know, your limited point of view. If you are looking at the global picture, you uh, have no aspirations uh, because you realize that everything you cared about before is actually a small part of a bigger picture. And, um, you know, uh, you better focus on that, on the bigger picture, because, you know, there are many catastrophes that can happen on Earth. And, you know, we are all in the same boat, the Earth, sailing through space. And if we keep fighting with each other, you know, we might not survive for very much longer. Uh, if we, on the other hand, cooperate and use the tools of science, to uh, we could figure out a better future. That's the way I think about it. Now, I'm not naive, and I don't think people will start singing uh, John Lennon's words, imagine uh, all the people living in peace just because they are idealistic. I don't think this would happen. It's in human nature to fight for resources. You know, we came from the jungle, uh, from Africa, and we were looking for you know, uh, some uh, limited resources. And of course, uh, someone's uh, benefit is other, uh, uh, other person's loss in t if you have limited resources. So that led to zero-sum games. And our brain is, is pretty much uh, hardwired to fight zero-sum games. But my point is science is an infinite-sum game because if, if we realize new knowledge, everyone benefits. And mm. science encourages us to work together. So how do I see a better future? Uh, as I said, I'm not naive. And I don't think our politicians are good role models. But I do think that if that we can go through shock therapy, meaning if we discover that uh, another civilization near another star is behaving in a, uh, has accomplished much more than we did, you know, it's sort of like meeting a student in the class that is doing far better <laughs> and uh, you realize that by imitating that student, you can do better. And so that's like shock therapy. Uh, and of course, it will be a blow to our ego. As you pointed out, the ego is not uh, a good place for us to, to attach to because um, it often limits us as to uh, appreciating that, that we are not you know, at, at, at the center of, of stage. And, um, you know, I, both my daughters, uh, when they were young, they thought the world centers on them. And uh, the shock was when they went on the first day to the kindergarten. Uh, and we need to go through that shock when we would realize that, you know, there are other kids out there and we are not the smartest uh, kid on the, on the block, on the cosmic block in this case. Mm -hmm. And uh, like when we look at politicians and when we 
you said that we came from the jungle. We are essentially some advanced apes, and the <laughs> and apes have the mentality. So when you study chimps, chimpanzees, they have the uh, innate instinct in them to form territories and to form alphas in their species, and they fight within each other. So if you think in that sense, countries are really advanced territories of chimps, and we've not even. <laughs> we not even thought enough to think past that and well, when you yeah but but um, if you look at the tools of science that you know were advanced mostly over the last century so forget about the, the before that that you know look at uh, where we are you know the two of us are communicating uh, i assume between different continents and uh, speaking to each other that's amazing you know so what i say very often is you know, Moses in the Old Testament, the Bible, uh, was very uh, impressed by a bush that uh, was burning without being consumed. So much so that he uh, decided to believe in a superhuman entity that made this bush as a miracle. Uh, so he believed in God. Uh, and that's the story. And today you could have impressed Moses much more by showing Moses a cell phone or, you know, uh, uh, anything that we are using routinely. Um, he would think that uh, is even a, a greater miracle compared to a burning bush. I mean, what's the problem? Make it, I mean, it's very easy to make a burning bush that is powered by electricity, and he would be shocked by that. Um, so the point is, today, we are able to impress people like Moses as if we are God, you know, as we uh, represent miracles. Um, and uh, this was brought about, you know, uh, by science and technology. So my point is we have one method that we uh, developed most recently, you know, and, and it's really precious and it's not appreciated enough. And it's the method of science. Now, I'm not claiming that scientists should be celebrated. Some people have the wrong idea that, you know, scientists should be regarded as celebrities. Uh, so the way you, uh, you admire uh, movie actors, uh, or, or singers, you know, there should be uh, Taylor Swift among scientists, like Einstein should be admired like, just like Taylor Swift. I don't think that is uh, what we need to focus on uh, because these scientists are practitioners. It's really the scientific method that we should celebrate and anyone can use it. You can use it in your daily life because the idea of the scientific method is that it's guided by data, by evidence. So in your daily life, you know, you collect data all the time. And if you use the scientific method, you will do much better than if you use um, emotions or, you know, things that uh, are not uh, really associated with analysis of evidence or data, because very often we are misleading ourselves. We uh, have wishful thinking, uh, or we prefer not to know things that we don't want to know. And what I'm saying is that science is bringing us to a better place as, as, a, as a culture, in humanity as a whole. Um, and uh, it's really a new tool that uh, we should uh, appreciate and use as much as we can uh, in order to have a better future. Yeah, I remember reading somewhere any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Oh, yeah. Well, I say that... that um, you know, if someone uh, understands quantum gravity, someone out there in interstellar space knows how the Big Bang happened uh, and knows how to, has a recipe for creating a baby universe because if you know what ingredients you need to put together in order to create the universe in the Big Bang, then you have the recipe book for doing that. You just need to create in the laboratory those conditions, just the way you bake a cake if you have a recipe book for a cake. And uh, then you can apply for the job description of God. Because <laughs> if you look at what are the requirements for God, <laughs> it's uh, creating a universe. If you can create a universe, go for it. You can become God. And if you can create life in the laboratory, mm -hmm. you know, that's a good early stage, uh, even <laughs> without creating a universe. And and we are on our way to creating life in the laboratory. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if within a century we'll, we'll have, uh, you know, life, uh, synthetic life that we created, uh, you know, existing here on Earth. This is on top of the 
AI, the artificial intelligence that uh, is a, our technological kid that would imitate the, the human brain in, in, in different ways. Mm -hmm. I was listening to your talks and I found this interesting sentence that you said, it, like physics is the closest to philosophy. I know you're a uh, lean to philosophy, but it got me thinking, why do, why do you say that? Well, um, it really depends on what aspect of physics one is dealing with, because most physicists, most scientists are working uh, on, uh, mat you know, using mathematical tools and, and computational tools to proceed along a path that was already defined by previous generations of physicists. Uh, but, you know, this is just like uh, if you are um, uh, participating in the construction of a building, uh, you put the bricks together with your fellows. That's that's on a daily basis what most scientists are doing. They are putting bricks together in the, in the construction project of, of, of science. And most of the time, you know, it's uh, sort of nuances on what was already known. You, the bricks are known. You just need to put them. Someone needs to put them. So someone needs to do a computer simulation of a particular system. Now, every now and then there are big advances because either an experiment shows a results that uh, you didn't expect and so you need to explain that okay or you make a prediction that was unexpected based on what we already know uh, these are rare instances and they often lead to significant advances in our knowledge but um, the philosophical aspect that you know I, I'm sort of interested also in is the architecture you know someone has to come up with a blueprint for the building in order to build the building so when you look at a beautiful building, you could credit all the people that put the bricks, okay? And that's an important uh, mission, you know, to, to make, to materialize it. But you should also give, give credit to the architect because mm. the architect basically wrote down a blueprint for where the bricks should be put. And the, the architect had in mind uh, the, the way the building would look like. And that's, you know, that's a very rare quality, being able to look uh, into the future and, and realize what, you know, what should we uh, seek? What kind of information should we seek? What, what should be the next important question in science that we should address? And I feel that way, for example, you know, I, I worked on the, on the first stars in the universe when it was not popular at all. That was 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, back then we started I, I was part of the first committee that designed the Webb telescope for that reason. I was among the the few uh, astrophysicists around the world interested in the first stars, the first galaxies. There weren't many people. And I basically pioneered the path on that and, and wrote two textbooks. And now there are, you know, it's a very popular field. It was even celebrated at the White House uh, when the first deep images from the Webb telescope were obtained. Uh, President Biden celebrated that uh, in the White House with the uh, uh, head of NASA, Bill Nelson. Uh, and um, obviously now it's a frontier, uh, but someone had to define it as an important frontier. And I remember in the early days when I worked on the subject, some of my colleagues were very doubtful. Some said, oh, there is nothing. I mean, galaxies uh, always existed the way they are. Um, you know, how do you know how to extrapolate the physics back in time and figure out the first stars? This makes little sense. Um, and so, you know, eventually we made progress. That's one example. Another example is I thought about the imaging black holes uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I remember in the first, uh, first conversations I had with colleagues, I would say, for example, imagine a hotspot, a bright region orbiting a black hole. If we could image it and see how the bright spot is moving, we can map the space-time around the black hole. And uh, my colleague said, oh, the bright spot would never survive even one rotation. It would uh, disperse very quickly. This is not worth my time. And these were younger colleagues, actually, that are 10, 20 years younger than I am. We, and they are highly regarded nowadays. They, you know, they are leaders in their field, but they were just skeptical that it's worthwhile. And, um, you know, fast forward uh, 15 years later, uh, a hotspot around the center of the Milky Way galaxy where there is a 4 million uh, solar mass black hole 
uh, was observed. You know, you could see a bright spot moving around the black hole. Uh, and just the way we were, uh, I, I ended up writing a few papers about it with my own postdoc at Harvard. Uh, and um, this is another example. And, and right now, um, you know, I'm uh, trying to promote um, the understanding that we should seek uh, uh, extraterrestrial intelligence in, in, in ways that are not uh, traditional. So people were uh, looking for radio signals. And that is just like uh, waiting for a phone call at home. And I'm saying you know, there is another way, which is to go out of your home and check if there are any packages uh, in your mailbox. You know, just go to your backyard and see if there are any physical objects that came from a neighbor's yard, from someone far away. And that's a very different approach than waiting for a phone call because nobody may call you. Uh, and um, so, you know, we are, I'm engaged in various um, uh, programs under the Galileo project that I'm leading to promote that. And I think it should be part of the mainstream in astronomy because this is a question that the public cares a lot about that will change our future. And uh, at the moment, you know, there aren't many funding sources for this uh, uh, search for objects near the Earth. You know, there are a few million objects uh, that are roughly a meter in size from outside the solar system within the orbit of the Earth around the Sun right now. We, can't, we are not monitoring them because they don't reflect enough sunlight for our telescopes to pick them up. But what I'm saying is there is a, a lot of stuff from outer space in our backyard. And we haven't checked if among the rocks there is any probe that was manufactured technologically. And that's what I'm trying to do. Now, to me, it sounds like common sense, something we should do. But uh, once again, as I witnessed in the, in the other examples that I mentioned, um, you know, it's, some people don't get it. Hmm. Before I go into the next scientific question, I have to ask, how do you come up with these analogies? Oh, um, you know, so when I started uh, uh, astrophysics, I was offered a, a position, a five-year position at the Institute for Advanced Study uh, without any experience in astrophysics. And, uh, and uh, I was given this opportunity by John Bacall, my mentor there, uh, who said, um, I will give it to you under the condition that uh, you will switch to astrophysics. And then he asked me, what kind of computer languages do you master? And I said, I don't use computer much. You know, I, I just use it when I need to solve some equations. That's pretty much it. I try to minimize it. And he said, how do you hope to have a career in astrophysics, in science, without working with a computer, because he was working with all the time with, uh, you know, a computer code that he was uh, developing. And, um, and here I am, you know, um, uh, some 30 years later, or more than that, even uh, almost uh, 40 years. Uh, and um, and uh, I, I had a very successful career. And so you ask me how, and the reason is that I have ideas all the time. And very often young people come to me and tell me what they are, they are doing. And it, within a matter of a few seconds, I ask them a question and then they say, well, I haven't thought about that. And then they end up, some ca in some cases, they end up working for the rest of their career on, on, on the idea that I brought up. I mean, there is an example of that with uh, someone who um, emailed me from uh, Vanderbilt uh, University um, and, and uh, suggested that we collaborate. And I said, great, uh, let's collaborate. He was working on the LIGO experiment to detect gravitational waves. And I said, why not build a, a LIGO experiment on the moon? Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, usually the limit to the sensitivity of LIGO at, at very um, low frequencies comes from seismic noise. The, uh, the Earth is vibrating and uh, does not allow the experiment, which is on the ground, to detect low frequency gravitational waves. I mean, this is the experiment that detected gravitational waves from the collision of uh, stellar mass black holes at the edge of the universe, and they got the Nobel Prize for it. Um, and um, so, so I said, why not do it on the moon? Because there you don't have seismic noise. And moreover, the experiment, the LIGO experiment, is based on a vacuum tube uh, in which you uh, shoot a laser beam and, and you put vacuum so that the laser beam will not be disturbed by uh, the air. Uh, in, 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 you know. But on the moon, there is no atmosphere. And so you get vacuum for free. And so... So I told him, why don't we check it? 
And, you know, that was uh, a few years back. And, and right now, this, this person is dedicated full time to uh, promoting this project for a gravitational wave detector on the moon. And it became an international project. Uh, I, I didn't stay with it, uh, but, but he, he is very excited about it. Now, it didn't really take me much time to say, why not put LIGO on the moon? You are working on LIGO, why not do that? I mean, this is just an easy thing, you know, and I don't fully understand why it takes other people uh, more effort because these ideas come very easily for me. So, so the same is true about the analogies. You know, you were asking me, how do I get my analogies? You know, that, it's just the way I think. It's not, it's not, I, I don't put any effort into this. Mm -hmm. I also found that you read a lot of philosophy. Has philosophy influenced your thinking in any ways? Oh, definitely. At a young age, uh, I was mostly interested in uh, existentialism. Uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, um, you know, uh, quite a number of them uh, inspired me. Uh, and the reason is that um, they were not, they didn't pretend, okay? So Sartre used to make fun of those uh, very pompous uh, adults that, uh, you know, have... Uh, a high self-esteem and they go to the theater dressed up and pretend to be very important. And, and um, you know, I like that uh, approach of basically, you know, looking at our existence the way it is and not pretending, you know, and, and that is, that translates right now to me as a scientist in um, acknowledging that there are important questions to which we don't have an answer. And the only way to find an answer it's not by arguing forever about our opinions, which is the way we deal with politics. You know, in politics, uh, we have an opinion, and that's pretty much it. Uh, and uh, you can argue with your opponents, but uh, it's really difficult to bring everyone to the same page. In science, there is an arbitrator, and the arbitrator is the experiment, you know, the, the data that comes uh, when you have an idea about the universe, about reality, and if you are able to test it with an experiment, that's the moment where you realize if the idea is valid or not. Okay? So that's an amazing tool. Uh, this arbitrator allows us to come together and agree, you know, once the experimental data is confirmed and, and robust, to agree on moving forward and on what we learned uh, through that. And, uh, you know, that is a beautiful way to make progress. Um, however, I should say that um, nowadays, as we discussed before, uh, politics is mixed with science. It's really unfortunate, but it is. And a lot of people uh, try to, uh, scientists try to show off by pretending that they know more, that they are experts, because their stature is based on past knowledge. So what you find is people who say, you know, I'm an expert on this subject. I pretty much know the answer. How dare you suggest that there is an anomaly or that there is something I don't know. I know that all the objects that are reported in the sky are probably from the solar system. And I don't believe the US government when it says there was an object moving too fast to be bound to the sun. They probably got it wrong because I'm an expert and you should believe me. And if this object, uh, the measurement of the speed was you know, wrong by a factor of three, then everything is fine. It was a stone from the solar system. Therefore, I would write a paper and publish it in the Astrophysical Journal, even after the U.S. Space Command wrote an official letter uh, to NASA confirming that this object, this meteor, came from outside the solar system. They went back to their data, checked it, and reported back. And this is the organization, the U.S. Space Command, that is supposed to report to the U.S. president about ballistic missiles being launched from adversarial countries, and they get a budget more than the budget of NASA. And then you have astronomers, experts, saying, I don't believe that data. I don't want to agree to that. And therefore, we haven't detected an interstellar meteor, which is the reality of the situation. Okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, this was done, actually, when I was in the Pacific Ocean, guided by the localization of the U.S. government uh, uh, satellites that gave us the coordinates of the fireball, the explosion that took place when this meteor collided with Earth. We were there to collect materials. And at the same time as I was heading back, this paper was submitted for publication in the Astrophysical Journal. 
approved for publication and published. Mm -hmm. And uh, they didn't even wait to see what are the materials that we retrieve. And just to explain, to do the scientific research, to collect materials, to find more data requires a lot of effort. To just say, oh no, I don't believe the US government, it's very easy. You sit on your chair and you write a paper why the government is wrong. But so, so this is science for you uh, right now that you have to cope with quote unquote people who work for decades as experts on a subject that do not want new knowledge to be recognized because they are not part of the discovery of the new knowledge. So they would try to suppress it as much as possible and raise dust and claim that they don't see anything. So on the one hand, you have those guys. On the other hand, you have people in the public uh, who have very superficial opinions as well. You know, they might be believers that we are being visited by extraterrestrial technologies. And, um, you know, just like in, in the context of politics, it creates polarization. You have very extreme opinions uh, that are fueling each other. The scientists are saying, we don't want to believe those uh, people who don't have any evidence on the other extreme. And the, uh, the, the other extreme says, we don't believe the scientists because we know the answer in advance. The, the bottom line is uh, the sensible thing to do, which is collecting data, collecting evidence, you know, is a, is a path that is not taken. It's, it's not it, it, the, the middle road, which makes the most sense, is difficult to take because you are attacked from both directions. On the one hand, the believers know already the answer and you dare not deviate from what they think. On the other hand, you have the, those uh, uh, skeptics who, no matter how much you do, they will try to dismiss it. Uh, and, um, you know, just walking that in that path, first of all, requires a lot of uh, dedication, a lot of uh, work and also money. You know, the expedition was one and a half million dollars. And, you know, we went there to the Pacific Ocean and the ocean depth is, is uh, two kilometers and the region was 11 kilometers on a side. It was a very tedious job to collect materials. So it, it's a lot of work, but you are being attacked at the same time that you are working on it from both directions. And, you know, that's the reality of uh, work uh, at the frontier that is not within uh, the, the, the confines of what we already know. And it's not easy. It's not easy to, to do that. But, um, you know, after so many decades that I uh, worked as a scientist, you know, I don't uh, bow down to those external pressures. I, you know, those critics uh, very often resemble, um, you know, um, uh, sport commentators that are looking at a soccer match and telling the players how to pass the ball. How dare they? I'm, I'm in the field doing the work, you know. And so... Um, so in a way, um, doing science, uh, you know, that is innovative is not necessarily easy because politics is mixed with it. And the innocence of being just curious uh, is, you know, it's, it's not easy to maintain. You can understand why very few people are willing to take this path. But the whole idea of it, academia is geared towards that because there is the concept of tenure where you shouldn't worry about your job security. And there is also the idea of blue sky research. You know, that's academia is the place where new ideas uh, should be developed. And yet you find these phenomena. Yeah, I was reading your latest book, Interstellar, and I actually wrote a line that really struck with me. I'll just read it out. It really uh, resonates with this. The spirituality of the scientific enterprise rests on the principles uh, pr principle that regard evidence that deviates from theory as an opportunity to learn rather than as a threat to expertise. Exactly. That, Let me give you an example on that. So all I'm saying is curiosity, being curious is really the way to make scientific progress. Okay. And so when uh, Oumuamua, this first object that came from outside the solar system uh, was discovered, we had a colloquium at Harvard University and uh, in the audience uh, next to me sat uh, an expert on solar system rocks. And when the colloquium ended, when the talk finished, we left the room together and he said to me, Oumuamua is so weird, I wish it never existed. And that's exactly the opposite of how science should be done. Because you should say Oumuamua is so weird 
I would like to know more about it. I want more data about it. It's really exciting because maybe we learn something new. But he was looking at it as a threat to his expertise in solar system rocks. Why should it, it, it created a cognitive, what is called a cognitive dissonance where he cannot hold in his head the idea that interstellar objects might be different from solar system rocks. It creates anger for him, a resentment. He, he is upset by the fact that here there is an object that came from outside the solar system that behaves in ways that he cannot easily explain uh, based on past knowledge on solar system rocks. So he's upset about it. I wish it never existed. It's better not to know that. And to me, that's anti-science because the whole point about science is the excitement you get when something does not stand up to your past ideas. Uh, it, it just doesn't support your prejudice and it's an opportunity for you to learn something new. And so why would the first object from outside the solar system look different? Well, because maybe it was produced by some process that is different than the way that solar system rocks were produced, okay? So even if it's natural, even if it's a rock from another star, I actually wrote a paper about it showing that the most common types of stars could produce rocks that are very different than the solar system because the, the, the most common type of stars uh, are l lower mass. They are 10% of the mass of the sun and they are much denser. They're also 10% of the radius of the sun. So, so they are denser than rock. And if you bring a planet like the Earth close to them, they could rip it apart. They will spaghettify the planet into a stream of rocks, some of which, half of which will be ejected to interstellar space. And this process happens very close to the star and could melt the rocks and make them very different than uh, solar system rocks. So the interstellar rocks, even if they are natural, could be very different than solar system rocks. And, you know, if we learn that, we learn something new. We should be happy about it, not sad. Mm. I mean, we already know that most of the matter in the universe is not the matter that the planets are made of. We already know that. So why would you think that everything coming into the solar system is reflecting the same physics as we know about the solar system? That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, as you talked about in politics and in this scenario as well, it both points to the, again, letting having the ability to letting go of your core held beliefs, that exactly. ego part as the barrier to knowledge. Exactly. And uh, what I'm trying to say is that it's also it also makes the endeavor exciting because mm -hmm. the minute you realize that you learn something new, you know, it's fun. Tomorrow is not the same as yesterday because you learn something new. And then, uh, you know, there was this uh, uh, biblical uh, statement that there is nothing new under the sun. Well, my point is that Oumuamua was something new under the sun. It's not <laughs> correct. <laughs> this statement is incorrect. Uh, there are new things that come into the solar system from outside and they reflect new knowledge. So we should not keep quoting things from the past. We should not qu keep quoting Enrico Fermi, where is everybody? We should not keep saying there is nothing new under the sun. Uh, by the way, the existence of rocks in the sky was doubted until 1803. People said it's a ridiculous idea. Uh, we see rocks on Earth. Why should rocks fall from the sky? And then there was a meteor shower in Liège, France, and that convinced the community that indeed uh, rocks can fall from the sky. And now we understand, of course, rocks fall from the sky because the Earth was made out of building blocks that were just like Lego pieces. There were smaller rocks that came together. So there are some resi residual, some relic, uh, uh, rocks in space left over from the construction project of the solar system and those are colliding with the earth every now and then and uh, uh, you know in addition some you know some objects are being disrupted by by Jupiter or other objects and so we get uh, those rocks uh, uh, for free and they collide with earth they always collide by the way I don't know if you are aware but there are a few collisions every year uh, of um, rocks big enough to create uh, the same energy release as the Hiroshima atomic bomb. So we have atomic explo I mean, the equivalent of atomic explosions high up in the atmosphere uh, every year. It's just not reported about. And because the objects burn up uh, and it's very high in the atmosphere. So the difference is that the Hiroshima bomb was uh, dropped 
and it exploded very close to the ground and created a lot of damage. And these, these rocks that collide with Earth, uh, they explode at altitudes of 40 to 70 kilometers. There was one that exploded uh, over Portugal and Spain just a few months ago, and uh, it exploded at uh, 70 kilometers altitude. It was roughly the same speed and the same size as the interstellar meteor that I mentioned before from 2014. But that interstellar meteor exploded at an, an altitude of 20 kilometers, not 70, where the air density is a thousand times bigger than it is at 70 kilometers. So that meant that this interstellar rock was at least a thousand times tougher than the one, than the solar system rock that exploded over Portugal uh, earlier this year. And so, again, it's made of materials that are not the same. You know, it's, it's unusual. It was an unusual material strength. And to me, it raised the possibility, you know, maybe it is uh, technological in origin. Because just imagine Elon Musk's uh, Tesla Roadster car, you know, that was launched in uh, 2018 as a a part of the Falcon Heavy test uh, launch. Um, if it collides with Earth, uh, it would appear as a meteor of unusual material strength. Uh, so we should just be open-minded to find those technological gadgets among the rocks that rain down from outer mm -hmm. space. I wanted to hear your opinion on the Kardashev scale. The Kardashev scale is uh, how how advanced the civilization gets. So a type one is when we are completely sustainable in our planet. And type two is when we harvest the power of the sun or we are sustainable at a solar system level. So how do we think about that? I think it was, I, I remember reading um, Carl Sagan, and he made a rough calculation that we are somewhere around 0.7. And uh, how far do you think we are from reaching that magic number one? Because I don't, I actually see that as a, good way to focus humanity on because I don't I don't see that anybody for that matter speaking about it where we, I, I actually think we should put that number everywhere you know like in Times Square and everywhere like we are 0 0.7 0 0.8 so that we have we all have a group incentive to work towards something yeah, <laughs> well, way, uh, when I went on the expedition to the Pacific Ocean that was featured on Times Square <laughs> okay but, um, uh, with respect to the Kardashev scale, in my book, uh, Interstellar, the, my latest book, uh, I talk about a better scale, which is um, uh, defined by, your, by the ability of the civilization to recreate the con conditions that it was born into. Okay? Mm. So as, you know, when we started, humanity started a few million years ago, we were just uh, adapting to whatever nature gave us on Earth. And then... Um, you know, we're starting now with modern technology to shape nature. Uh, but you can imagine a situation in the future. For example, we're getting our energy from the sun uh, on Earth, but you can imagine uh, building a, a, a space station uh, or a space uh, craft where you put people and they uh, can survive for many centuries because you provide the uh, artificially, you provide the conditions that allow them to live there the living conditions, the habitat appears to be suitable for life for a long time. And then uh, you can imagine a, a civilization that develops life in the laboratory so that we can recreate life. As of now, we have one way of creating life, which is to uh, have children, uh, you know, and uh, um, but in the future, it might be possible to make li artificial life. Uh, and then uh, ultimately, you know, the most advanced civilization might be able to create a, b a baby universe in the laboratory, meaning everything. You know, like you create a universe inside of which you have, you know, trillions of galaxies like the Milky Way, uh, inside of which you, you have uh, hundreds of billions of stars like the sun, next to which you have, you know, at least uh, a quarter of those stars have a planet the size of the Earth roughly at the same separation that give rise to life. So, so you are everything that we are born into, you recreate in the laboratory. That is the sign of the most intelligent uh, civilization that I can think of. As I said, it's, that civilization can apply for the job of, of God. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that is my scale. My scale is based on the ability of the civilization to create the conditions that it was born into. And uh, by the way, right now, AI represents an attempt to reconstruct 
human intelligence. You know, if we have enough connections uh, in uh, AI systems, as many as the number of synapses in the human brain that connects uh, that connect neurons, then uh, we might uh, get to the same level of complexity as the human brain. As of now, uh, LLMs, I mean, large language models, there are still a few orders of magnitude below the number of uh, connections in the human brain. I just wrote an essay about that. Uh, but uh, since the uh, evolution is exponential, maybe the you know within the coming decades, we will have AI systems that are as complex as the human brain. So that's another attempt to reproduce something that was given to us uh, naturally. And, you know, we're trying to produce fusion in the laboratory. Uh, and just uh, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a successful attempt uh, using lasers at the uh, Livermore National Lab in the U.S. Uh, but it was a tiny pellet in which we achieved uh, a release of uh, energy more than we uh, invested in the pellet. Uh, but um, the sun is doing it on a routine basis. You know, the sun... Uh, um, so we are trying to imitate nature. And that is, to me, the measure of intelligence, the ability of us to produce what we find in the natural world. And that's the way I, 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 I mean, it doesn't necessarily require uh, a lot of energy if you know the trick, you know. So the idea is more to be uh, for, for intelligence is and not to use a scale that shows power in terms of energy or strength or physical strength, but more in terms of uh, intellectual ability to reproduce the reality that we are born into. That, that is my scale. That's how I define uh, uh, the levels of intelligence of technological civilizations, which is, which is very different than uh, Kardashev's scale. But will that ensure the continuity of the species? Because I imagine if we become type 2 and become a spacefaring civilization and something happens to Earth, there's always plan B. Right, right. But uh, if you can reproduce the reality that you are that you are born into, you really not uh, you don't need to necessarily go places. You can do it at home. <laughs> you can create the reality that you are born into, and uh, I mean, you can create for in the examples that I mentioned, you can create a spacecraft that imitates the habitable condition on a planet, and so then you don't really need to go mm. to another planet. It mm. saves you a lot of time. You know, if you are. Uh, intelligent enough, you don't need to go places. Uh, you can recreate the conditions that you want to, to have. So, so what's the idea of travel? The idea of travel is you say, oh, well, uh, the conditions in another country appeal to me and I, I want to visit that country in order to see the, those, to live those conditions. That's why you need to travel, to go to a place where you think you will, you know, it's a desirable place for you to be, to be in. Uh, and then uh, I'm saying if you can recreate that place uh, and at your home in the basement, you don't need to go there. Uh, so, <laughs> so, um, so it saves you. I, I, it doesn't necessarily require a lot of energy. You know, I, I, I would argue that trying to uh, uh, use as much energy as, as we can is a very sort of, uh, how should I say, um, a non-intelligent approach because you're basically trying to demonstrate power. But but to me, power is the ability to reproduce everything. Like, mm. uh, you are not really going places. You don't need a lot of energy. If you, if you can create a baby universe, then everything will happen inside of it. You know, like, that's an amazing feat. Do, do you watch the show Rick and Morty? There's a whole episode in Rick and Morty that explains the same thing, where Rick is the scientist, and he has his car battery that has an entire baby universe in it, and suddenly it stops working, and he goes he goes into the universe and teaches them to make electricity, and he partly channels the energy to char charge his car battery, and <laughs> and after I um, I wrote a scientific paper just a, a few weeks ago that was just published um, about um, the idea that you know I I designed an engine that mm -hmm. uh, is the most efficient engine that you can ever imagine that converts mass to energy using the Einstein's equations. Uh, you know, E equal mc squared. Uh, so basically you are getting 100% uh, of the trash that you use as fuel. So the fuel is not very uh, sophisticated, you know. Uh, of course you can do the same if you have antimatter and you throw it uh, on top of matter, then the two annihilate. But, um, you know, in the... A history of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, or in the entire history of CERN, 
they produced only 10 nanograms of antimatter, and that would be sufficient to power a 60 watt light bulb for four hours. That's it. Over the entire history of sun, that's how much antimatter. I'm saying you can just take your trash, drop it in this engine. You don't need any special type of matter. Uh, just drop your trash, whatever you don't like, and you get 100% the equivalent of that mass in energy. You know, that's, that's hundreds of times more than the best nuclear explosion can give you or, or nuclear reactors. Or, you know, it's, it's just unimaginable. Um, and um, the other thing is that this engine has no moving parts in it, and it has no uh, surfaces that need to be refurbished. Hmm. Uh, so what is it? Uh, so this engine is uh, a small black hole. You know, if you imagine a black hole that weighs about 100,000 tons, um, such a black hole would evaporate, according to Stephen Hawking, mm. within one and a half years. It will uh, radiate its mass. Um, but if you keep dumping into it about 2.2 kilograms per second, so okay. you are throwing your trash into it. And, you know, two kilograms per second is roughly when you flush the toilet, that's how much water gets down into the <laughs> toilet, okay? So all you need is to flush your toilet into a, this black hole. Uh, and, um, uh, and then you compensate for the mass loss of the black hole as a result of Hawking evaporation. And then basically the black hole keeps evaporating, so it gives you back pure energy for the mass mm -hmm. that you feed it. Uh, and the, the question is, how do you, you know, so I suggested, well, maybe a, an advanced civilization would put such a black hole in an orbit around the planet, and then it will shine just like the sun does and uh, provide the energy supply that you need uh, to the planet. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the question is how to make such a black hole. It's not easy because you need an extremely high density of matter to make it. So, so that problem I didn't solve. But I said, if we ever see a moon of a planet uh, that is otherwise away from any star, and the moon is illuminating very brightly the planet, uh, and the moon is not a star, it's just a tiny object, uh, you know, a satellite moving around the planet, then uh, maybe an, an advanced civilization, you know, developed the idea that I have for an energy source that is 100% efficient, and you can throw your trash into it. Blue sky is the limit. Uh, I think our time is almost running out, but I had one, one other question that I wanted to ask you. Everybody talks about this theory of everything that we want to combine uh, gravity with the quantum. What actually will happen if we really figure that out? Will that be, like, how will that change humanity? Oh, well, first of all, uh, from an academic point of view, it will help us understand what happens at the center of a black hole. Mm -hmm. Because uh, just imagine matter falling into a black hole. We don't know where it goes. Of course, you can say, okay, well, and I suggested that to string theorists. I said, if you want to figure out whether your theory is correct, just enter a black hole and go all the way to the center and you will see what happens there because that will be a test. But uh, then they argue that they have an ulterior motive of sending them into a black hole because they can never come back. Um, so the point is, it's not really practical for us to e experimentally figure out what happens at the center of a black hole. But if we have a theory of quantum gravity that is predictive, we can actually figure out, and you know, at the very high curvature near the center, what really happens to the matter. My conjecture is that uh, the matter reaches some maximum density and makes an object, just like a star of extremely high density, the Planck density near the center. But, um, you know, I just don't know. Uh, we, do, we don't know because we don't have a theory of quantum gravity. Then another academic uh, issue is, um, you know, what happened before the Big Bang. And again, that, you know, that's a very interesting question because that reflects our cosmic roots. And given a theory of quantum gravity, we will be able to go back and figure what could have started our universe. Uh, now, in terms of practical uses, well, it's possible that, you know, once we understand quantum gravity, we can develop an engine based on, on that understanding that, that is far better than what, you know, an engine that is using somehow space-time 
and manipulate space-time in a way that we can't figure out just with Einstein's theory of gravity that doesn't have quantum mechanics. And so, you know, I'm, um, I, I think it could really revolutionize our technologies if we had that. And of course, we can get a shortcut just by seeing a neighbor that was able to figure it out. Um, if we see some probes that are maneuvering in ways that we cannot explain, maybe they do it by understanding quantum gravity. Maybe they have quantum gravity engineers that <laughs> they design those vehicles. So it would feel like cheating in an exam where instead of us figuring it out, we copy it from a student in our class. But um, I would rather have that than remain ignorant. Mm. I feel actually really sad now that one hour has passed and I, we really didn't get time to talk about Oumuamua. <laughs> That's okay. We talked about other things and uh, people can find more in my um, uh, TED talk that I gave recently. And also uh, on medium.com, I put the, an essay almost every day. And there is one that I submitted just a, a few hours ago. So, so go to aviloeb at medium.com. You will find much more content. And uh, my two books, uh, Extraterrestrial and Interstellar, are available. And I'm now working on my next book uh, to, that is related to the expeditions. Well, that was Professor Avi Loeb joining with us, exploring the possibilities of human species on a cosmic level, how far we can reach and the long journey we all got ahead. I hope you all enjoyed the episode. If you did, please check out our other videos and share it with your peers as well. This is your host Raj signing off from The Seekers, Mind Talks, the Science and Spiritual Podcast.